All right, here we are, everybody. Next uh, SSMF at Home series. Um, my name is John Kilkenny. It's great to be here. And uh, before we get started, for those watching, I just want to make mention that we've announced our new winter program. Uh, Swanee is going to be offering a, a one-week winter music program uh, in January, January 3rd to 8th. January 3rd to the 8th, um, and it's going to be a great, great week of master classes and workshops and uh, sessions on mindfulness and practicing and practice techniques and uh, really a chance to reboot and reorganize yourself for the new year and what we hope will be a great uh, or certainly at least a better uh, 2021 than we've had so far. So excited for this program and uh, visit our website, check out our social media for more information about that. Uh, but I'm here today uh, to talk to a good friend and a wonderful member of our uh, Swanee faculty and also professor of bassoon at the uh, Frost School of Music at the University of Miami, uh, Gabriel Beaver. So, hey, Gabriel, how are you? Hi, John. Thanks for having me. This Great is pretty here. cool. Yeah, it's a good time. So so we started this series uh, over the summer and decided to continue it now, um, in, in at least in part, for us to uh, introduce uh, folks that are connected to Swanee with our faculty and, and the work that you all do. Uh, you know, in normal times, in pre-COVID times, you know, people come to the mountain and they spend four weeks with us. And uh, sometimes it's hard to kind of know what projects and, and work that people are doing outside of their time in Swanee. So we've got a couple of missions today, right? So the first one is to talk about some of the work you're doing, your new CD uh, and recording projects. But but first, I, I'd like to just kind of give you a chance to introduce yourself to to the folks that are watching and that will watch this. Tell us a little bit about your career, what you're doing now, how things are going in Miami. I know there were some issues over this summer with COVID. So uh, how you're teaching and all of that is going. So how are you doing? Good. Things are things are good, as good as they can be. You know, the University of Miami has a, a comprehensive plan for uh, keeping folks safe and people are doing their doing their job. They're they're wearing their masks, social distancing. And we've uh, even with the School of Music did air study plans so that we know how long it's safe to be in a given room and what kind of things. So and people are taking it seriously. Um, so honestly, it doesn't really feel that different except for the masks quite frankly and it's uh the the city of miami is pretty bustling now too as cases go down so that's so things are things are pretty good um but as john said i'm the professor of bassoon at the frost school of music at the university of miami and you said you wanted me to tell you a little bit about my career i guess um I, sorry yeah so so you know maybe how you got started and you know your training and you know your teaching philosophies all those those fun things not an interview for a job but i'm just kind of curious you know how you became this sort of multi-versed bassoon artist here yeah well that's interesting um so getting the call to teach at swanee is really cool for me because i grew up 90 miles southwest of swanee near huntsville alabama and i didn't know about swanee growing up I didn't have, I mean, I, it's interesting. I mean, bassoon, so I got into bassoon through a high school band director. His name's David McDaniel. I think he's a band director now in Talladega, Alabama. Hi, David, if you're listening. Um, and um, he just had the, the foresight to take some students who maybe had some talent and kind of fill out his band in places he needed, oboists, bassoonists and stuff. And he um, asked me to try the bassoon out and knew that it would motivate me, I think, and it did. And so I got into that. I was also a pianist. And so I, I actually had a little gig in high school playing piano for a local Presbyterian church. They paid me $25 a week. And I took that money and gave it to my mom to drive me down to the University of Alabama to study with the bassoon teacher there once a month, take a marathon bassoon lesson. Uh, and so it all worked out. You know, I became a bassoonist. I ended up going to school in Boston and then later in, in Dallas, Texas at SMU and um, got into academia right away at the University of Missouri, but still had some curiosity about playing. So I actually um, got into the New World Symphony after here in Miami, after becoming a professor at a university. And then one, uh, um, one year in the Virginia Symphony and then decided, hmm, I liked that professor job and I ended up going to LSU for many years. And now um, I'm, after many years later, I'm back here in Miami where I've been the professor, the, the associate professor of bassoon. This is my eighth year. That seems hard to believe. So um, and so when you asked me about like the diversity of my interests, 
we're going to talk a little bit about my album. That's why I brought up my sort of upbringing as a, as a church pianist. Um, I played pit percussion in our fantastic marching band where the band director had um, me and my uh, percussion mates um, arrange the, the music for the pit. So we had to take the charts that they had and make our own parts. So I learned about reading a score and arranging and, and playing and interacting with music outside of my instrument. It's, it's, it's about the music and then just whatever medium I pour it through, is, it doesn't matter. And I think that got me ready for bassoon. And I love all styles of music. Well, you know, it's it's great. It's great to hear it. You you, you mentioned something that I, I haven't really connected with in a long time. But as a percussionist, uh, I, I spent an oddly large amount of time with bassoon players, and then later as a teacher, with bassoon students who were playing in 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 pits and and playing percussion. And so there's like this sort of little underground connection between bassoonists and percussionists. And I don't know if that's influenced any of your your later work. I know a number of the recordings and a number of the chamber pieces you've done has, have a ton of percussion in it. So uh, just always, you know, it's an interesting little aside there that, um, you know, that you, you played, so you did actually play percussion. So technically you're you're part of my club here, right? <laughs> a long and time I, ago. I mean, we're ago. talking 1995. But uh, so, <laughs> I mean, it. I'll tell you, I, the main thing I think it influences anybody who's doing new music is you guys are kind of where it's at. And so if you're looking out there for a great composer, I would say, look who's writing new music for percussion. And chances are they're probably somebody you want to write for you as well. And I think that's a big part of it. And so that's, you guys are, don't seem to be bound by convention. You know, if you can make it, make a sound, the composer will write it into the music. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we definitely, um, you know, it can get a little treacherous every so often, but I think percussionists are definitely interested in, in letting composers kind of run wild with what we do. I mean, the, the, I, the, some of the most fun I've ever had is just sort of opening the door to a percussion room with some composers and going, have at it, right? It's like, figure it out. Um, but I, before we leave, we leave Miami, um, I want to just give, give you a chance to tell us a little bit about the program there. I mean, I, from a distance and you know, I know Svetstiana very well and, and the percussion faculty there, and I've sent some students there before. And so I'm familiar with the institution, you know, from that avenue. But I'm, I've been really impressed over the years with what uh, your dean has done and what other members of the faculty have done to kind of elevate that or uh, the entire institution, you know. And so if you could just take a minute and talk about um, the work at Frost and, and your, your, your new orchestra conductor, who uh, we all know uh, very well, and kind of how that's working out and, and what you all are doing there and what you think makes that such a, a special experience. Well, the, thanks for serving that up on a platter so I could talk about it. Um, I, I often tell people that and maybe they were doing, I, I'm not sure what was going on here when I came out of high school in 1995. Certainly the roots of the things we're doing now were definitely here then. It's always been a school that embraced um, uh, diverse styles of music, um, especially with their amazing jazz program. Um, but not knowing what was going on here, if I just focus on what we're doing now, I often say, this would have been the ideal place for me coming out of high school. And I wish as much as I love my, my, my institutions that I went to when I was in high school, I played piano in the jazz band. I improvised. I had a job playing piano at a local church. I played pit percussion. I composed. I feel like if I had come to a place like frost, all those interests would have been really fed like, Oh, if you want to do it here, here's the person that can teach you that. And even technology, I mean, I, I was doing MIDI and multi-track MIDI recording back then, which is all the way now come full circle that in my 40s, I'm using some of that to apply to this pandemic. And I'm at a school full of faculty who embrace technology and um, can be innovative. And we're doing like multi-track recording with chamber music and things like that. And so... I think that's one of the things that makes us special is that we're developing the whole individual. And a lot of schools say that that's, that's a popular thing to say now, but I think it's true. I really think um, when a student comes to audition for me on bassoon and they tell me that they're interested in writing music for the movies, but they really want to be a great bassoonist. Fine. This is the place to go. Our faculty write 
uh, music for uh, Netflix series and for and for movies and win Emmys and uh, and then you can also still play for me. And you you mentioned um, Jerry Schwartz. You mentioned our new conductor. I mean that's really special for me because years ago when I was a student at uh, NOI, one of the most memorable uh, performances I ever did was playing Principal on Shostakovich Eight at uh, at, a, at a summer festival with him. And actually, in my early days of auditioning for college jobs, I used excerpts from that recording because it was such a fine recording and that that Shostakovich age had such big bassoon solos as my application, like part of my dossier back then. Um, and so that was special to get to share that with Jerry when he came on the faculty and he's doing great things, drawing big audiences when we could still have big audiences and drawing uh, a capacity socially distanced audience for our first uh, chamber concert this year. Chamber orchestra concert, sorry. No, of course. And, and you know, I, I think most of most uh, orchestral musicians and, and, you know, folks our generation, I think we're perhaps the exact same age, uh, you know, work with Jerry c coming forward in our careers. I mean, I had the chance in Aspen and it, 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 my undergraduate to, to work with him um, a couple times professionally too, and see his work in New York when he was uh, still doing New York Chamber Symphony. And, uh, you know, he's somebody who not only is, you know, a terrific musician and a, and a really thoughtful and smart person and musician, but, um, you know, has built a lot of these things, you know, f himself and brings such a, a wealth of um, skills, you know, to to the students there and, and you know, his work in, in Seattle and, and all that he's done to kind of create you know, create a career and now he's writing and I know he's doing a lot of speaking and, and I'm still incredibly engaged as a performer and a conductor and, you know, his work at Eastern. I don't want to talk about his other summer program, but, uh, you know, I, I can't talk about Jerry and not at least say it once. But uh, at any rate, you know, it's wonderful that he's there and, and it's it's really impressive to see what what University of Miami is doing. And so I, I'm I'm a little jealous and also uh, really enjoying the, the to be able to see what y'all are doing there. Um so I, I want to talk a little bit about your recordings, and I want you to explain to me how exactly you plan on becoming a rock star on the bassoon, because that's <laughs> definitely what um, this is like. And I know I'm going to share some video here in a second, but I don't know if you want to you want me to do some playing now. You want to share some video now, or should we chat first? How do you? I can, do I can chat just a second. Sure. Um, so, man, it could take me more than a second. There's a whole lot of things tied up in this, um, but. The, the the easiest and most obvious thing to say that I there were two ideas that I had um, that really gave rise to this project. One is to ask Robert J. Bradshaw to write me a piece influenced by sort of rock and roll influences. Uh, if you go to the Sewanee um, website or YouTube channel, last summer I played, or two summers ago, sorry, I played the James Lawson Strange Interlude, um, number three. And I had been playing some of this type of music um, where uh, just like throughout classical music history, the composers were influenced by other styles. In that case, James Lawson used to live in uh, uh, New Orleans and he was influenced by blues and rock and he wrote that piece. And then I played a piece by um, Gerno Wolfgang called Moods in Blue. And so I really liked the way those composers were using acoustic bassoon uh, with piano and using that style. And I asked Rob Bradshaw to write me a piece for bassoon and percussion. But what Rob did is he said, we should also amplify it and plug it in to pedals. Well, sure. Why not? Right. Yeah. Let's just go nuts. Yeah. And we've worked with it for it. There's some people doing, doing that a long time. Uh, Paul Hansen is maybe our most famous virtuoso in that, in that era, that area. Um, and, but it's the thing that's maybe slightly different is that, I'm writing a piece that's through composed, like a concerto that's written out for me with prescribed, whereas Paul is a world renowned improviser. Um, and there's other folks like Trent Jacobs who created the, the microphone that goes in the vocal that even makes it possible for us to do it the way we do. So that was one leg of that. And the reason I was in, interested in those rock and roll things is I grew up in North Alabama, not too far from Nashville. And one of my uh, high school classmates growing up I studied with Dickie Betts from the Allman Brothers. Like he played electric guitar and like would go up to Nashville and like take lessons and it, like even got to play with those guys. And he played in our high school jazz band with us. So, I mean, I have a genuine interest in rock and blues that goes way back, especially North Alabama being, you know, like like Muscle Shoals and, and Florence and that era. area. And so 
it was just a perfect marriage of those two things. Well, on the other leg of this for this album, I have been fascinated for a long time by the fact that bassoon is such a weak instrument compared to brass, but we're asked to play unison with brass all the time. And apparently that an orchestration thing like it helps the buzz of the bassoon playing really loud in the middle of the brass creates a new color well i had been asking around the composers to maybe consider writing some kind of amplified piece for bassoon before i'd gotten to the, the rock and roll stuff um, but what sort of made it all come together was having my colleague charles norman mason uh, having a conversation with him and him hearing the premiere of the piece by bradshaw and going hey this might actually work and he writes the piece you're about to hear, Swagger, for me for Amplified Bassoon, Brass Quintet, and Percussion. And to my knowledge, it's the first ever piece of chamber music for Amplified Bassoon, Brass Quintet. So uh, if it's not the first, please forgive me, folks. But in my research, it's the first one I can find. You're muted, John. Can't hear you. You would think I would figure out how to unmute things. Don't worry, I'm still here. Don't no worry. Uh, I'm going to share. I'm going to share some a couple things on the screen here. Um, some of the recordings that you have. Uh, so let me let me let me go to the first one here, which is I think just uh, a recording session. So let me go here, and uh, we'll play some of this. Tell us a little bit about. <laughs> This project and this collaboration came about via a conversation with uh, one of my esteemed colleagues, Charles Norman Mason. Charles Mason, I uh, chair the composition department at the Frost School of Music at the University of Miami. And that's where I met uh, Gabriel. He uh, had come down for an interview and then was hired. And so uh, we took him out to lunch and he started talking then about wanting a piece. I knew about Chuck's music, I took a listen to it, I know you had written some things for Wind Ensemble, and I floated the idea of an amplified bassoon and brass and percussion piece to him. First I thought, amplified bassoon, you know, what's that? But then when he played it, because he has a special way of creating that instrument, it's not just playing into a microphone, it was this glorious sound. I thought, oh, this, yeah, I would love to write for this. <laughs> So when Gabriel uh, told me he wanted to record it up here in Boston with Triton Brass, I was like, I was really excited about that. This collaboration with Triton Brass came quite naturally. First, A, I needed a brass quintet. B, Wes Hopper, um, the trombonist in Triton Brass, is one of my oldest friends. Uh, the interesting thing about it for me is that the project's been ongoing for about four years, and it's come together now with uh, my very good friend from middle school. So a very long time ago, Gabriel Beavers and I went to school together in Hartzell, Alabama. So we're super stoked to get that put out and uh, into the hands of you modern music lovers out there. As a bassoonist in the orchestra, over the years, I'm used to sort of being flyover territory. Like, the bassoons are here, the brass are there, and we're just getting mowed down. And I thought, hmm, what could put me on equal footing? I started thinking about the confidence that it would take a bassoonist to come out on stage and play that, and the arrogance. And so then, therefore, that brought out the uh, title of uh, Swagger. <laughs> Thank you. I think about that last note. It's a high F, and knowing that you're there in the D.C. area, I bought the, I bought that bassoon from Truman Harris in the National Symphony oh, in 2006. Yeah. 
And I remember it had a high F key on it. And I thought, I'll never use that key. But whatever, it's a good bassoon, I'll buy it anyway. Well, thank you, Truman. So you never know when you're going to need a high F when you're recording yeah. a piece with a brass quintet in Boston. So so that's an incredible performance and in, in, uh, the, the quintet. So the, the brass quintet, we connected to one of the players in there from back, back in the day, and that, they're terrific. So, so that was great to hear. Now, you told me about another piece here, uh, and I want to maybe pull up the four-year consideration video here. Uh, now, this is with New Deco Ensemble, and, mm -hmm. and New Deco Ensemble and, and their conductor, Giacomo Barros, has a connection to Swanee. Uh, and to me personally, we went to school together, uh, we've known each other for a long, long, long time. And back to, I think even before I was at Juilliard, we were, um, we went to Aspen. I was in Aspen with, I mean, known the guy forever. And uh, just, you know, when he was a tuba player and is now, you know, doing a ton of really interesting and creative work as a conductor and has been with us for uh, the two summers that I've been uh, director at Swanee and, and looking forward to having him back in the future. Um, and also leads New Deco Ensemble, which is based in Miami. And you play with them, right? Yes. I mean, this everything's tied together with this. So this the germ of this album, uh, The Miracle of Lascaux, I think it's the next piece we're going to talk about, mm -hmm. actually sort of was my ticket into New Deco. I asked around and a colleague of mine here uh, at um, University of Miami played in a, um, a string quartet with members that became founding members of New Deco. Oh, cool. And I was able to get a grant to hire them to premiere a reduced orchestration version of the Miracle of Lascaux. Well, sometime during the couple of weeks we we're preparing it, Sam Hyken and Giacomo Myros were doing a pitch to local musicians about this new chamber orchestra they wanted to start and invited me because here I am playing this piece that has crossover influences. Little did I know what that would do for me. And um, I'm sort of, so I'm a founding member. I don't claim, when I say founding member, I just mean I've been there from the beginning. I didn't have anything <laughs> to do with founding it. I just showed up and those guys right, did all right, the work. Right. But what they've been able to do, Sam Hyken and Giacomo Byros have taken this idea and grown it into a cultural icon of Miami. We're synonymous with the city. It's got a large budget with a uh, board of directors. And we play with Jacob Collier. I mean, um, I mean, I don't know if we even mention anybody like uh, uh, Ben Folds. Uh, one of my favorites is a hip hop artist named Bilal, PJ Morton. Um, gosh, there's so many to name. And um, we play small intimate venues and the Arsh Center. So wow. I always knew that my goal would be to scale up the Miracle of Lasco and record it with New Deco. What I didn't know is how receptive Sam and Giacomo would be to the idea. I, I was able to secure a grant to hire the musicians to play with me and really blowing what kind of blew me off my feet was that when New Deco, New Deco was recording our debut album called New Deco Ensemble, um, you can find that one on Spotify as well. Um, Sam and Giacomo came to me and said, you know, we're having to rent criteria recording studios for 12 hours we have to take the place over would you want to use the space uh to record your album when in our off time wow and i was like well yeah i would sure. amazing right right yeah and absolutely that to, to let you guys know we recorded the hit factory it used to be called the hit factory criteria recording studios here in miami okay that's where uh derek and the dominoes eric clapton recorded layla it's where Hotel Cal part of Hotel California where the Eagles was recorded and so many more. I mean, it's historic. So to record a, uh, a part of my kind of crossover album in that historic space was really special. And uh, this was recorded in summer of 2018. And it's taken a while uh, because every track on this album is with a different, as you saw, one tracks with the uh, uh, Triton Brass in Boston between all the disparate spaces and disparate people, it's taken a while to get the album together. And um, uh, COVID unfortunately yeah. gave me the time at home to finish listening to all the edits and let's get it out there for the world to hear. And I'm proud to share this. This is a track from um, Robert J. Bradshaw's Miracle of Glasgow um, for Amplified Bassoon, Percussion and Strings.
let that go a little longer because I, I wanted to get a little taste of Brett's piece yeah. too, which I, I know we, we have another mutual. Uh, if any students ever watch this or are watching this or will watch it in the future, uh, just take note of the number of mutual co connections and friends and colleagues we have here. I mean, it's a constant masterclass in the field, right? But Brett Dietz, a wonderful percussionist and uh, head of the percussion program at LSU, terrific composer, uh, really accomplished in, in so many different ways. And, and uh, I just wanted to hear just a clip of his music because I'm a fan of his work. So thanks and, for indulging uh, me there. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because that's something I've been fascinated by. You know, I, this is my third solo album. Um, and the way I see it, I mean, maybe not everybody see it this way, but like um, as a tenured professor at a university, this is my creative output. This is my sort of more indelible output. Of course, I perform um, live, but I have something out there. This is sort of my book. It's not as academically high-minded as a book, but so what is my role as a professor? My first album was of music of Gordon Jacob, which is important to the history of bassoon players. And I was fascinated by how Archie Camden and Lady William Waterhouse um, collaborated with um, Gordon Jacob to come up with all these fantastic works that are, are standards now. And moving forward from that, what do I do? Can I just keep recording Beethoven, I mean, not Beethoven, but like famous bassoon works? Or what can I put in the world? And so this is my second album of all new music, most of which has been written for me. This one was all written for me. And that I feel like is goes back to your comment about interconnectivity. Throughout history, some of the more important people we think about were just friends at one point. You know, uh, Picasso and his group of artists around him or um, uh, just even composers. And they're, they're people who moved in the same circles and their work sort of elevated each other. And that's how I see it. Um, I had these other two pieces that were heavy with percussion. And I thought, who do I know as a percussionist composer? And Brett Dietz. And he hadn't written a piece for bassoon. So I reached out to him. And the way I see it, it's raising all of our um, profiles as performers, composers, and all that. And now there's four new works out there in the world because of because of that. So that's what I'm going for. Well, and it's so it mean, really important that you mention all of that, frankly. But, but just to narrow on one thing specifically, just that... I think it's easy for students and even even for people out of school that are kind of in their early stages of their career. Uh, and, you know, now is a particularly insanely difficult time for so many reasons. Um, COVID being, you know, a big one, but there are others. Um, most of this just happens because we ask our friends to do things for us. Right. I mean, I think yeah. uh, when I talked to to Giacomo over the summer, we did one of these uh chats uh, in July. And, you know, he talked about his friendship with Sam and that they just sort of thought Miami needed this and, you know, they wanted to do this and have a creative outlet and something that they could sort of own and manage and, and, and it could be their project. And that's what brought forward, um, new deco. And I, I think there's so many important, uh, projects and commissions and organizations that come forward because people just want to make music together, you know, and then there's usually somebody that figures out, you know, maybe more of the business aspect of it or the money aspect of it or whatever. And then there's the marketing and then maybe there's the artistic person, but all of that kind of stuff, um, you know, comes together into something that, uh, you know, I think people think it's more planned than it actually is. You know, usually it's just like, hey, let's, let's make some music. Or in your case, it's like, well, I, you know, I either I'm going up for tenure or I want to, you know, get, pr 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 get a promotion and I don't want to keep recording the same music. I also think that's a super important point to underline um, for anyone uh, checking this out. You know, it's great to record the classics, but I don't know if we need another recording of whatever piece, right? We don't. We, 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 we don't. we don't. But there's so much music out there, either that hasn't been written or that has been written and not championed. And this is such a, you know, it's been a good time for a while. So I don't want to make it like this is some unique thing. But we are in a unique moment where, I mean, I, I think every piece I'm doing this semester with my university ensemble, except for one, uh, is not only new to me, new to the students, but is a new composer to our studio. And, and uh, I'm not saying that to sort of do a, to brag or be a humble brag, but it's just, I'm forcing myself to think about this and it hasn't been, it wasn't hard. It's great music and, and the students are enjoying it and it's, it's different composers and it's, it's a different experience. And so, um, 
you know, go out and find some stuff, right? Or commission it and and record it. And certainly when you have, you know, the, the caliber of playing that you're able to bring to the table and the, the folks you're able to assemble, it's really, it's really exciting. So um, before we get wrap up as much as I, you know, there's so, so many things we, we could talk about. I want to just get, give us a chance to talk a little bit about Swanee and, and your work there. Um, I know you've been with us. I, I wish I could say three consecutive summers, but you've been with us three, three t- summers twice in person, I think, and then once or in, in, in over Zoom, whatever it is. Um, that, don't just, you know, talk about Swanee, but all, you know, the importance of summer training and continuing that kind of work and the connections you make as students to teachers and and other colleagues in the summer um, and how that has perhaps influenced your life or you've seen it influence the lives of, lives of your students? I think summer festivals are everything, quite frankly. I mean, I, I did two summer festivals in high school um, and it, I did one really small out of the way one that people probably wouldn't know about but it was such a um amazing experience that the next year i aimed higher and then i went to an, another prominent festival that i won't name because we're promoting swanee dang it and but it was expensive for for my family and i yes. i went out was it I, in the mountains was it in a in a, was, in a mountain resort it, yes it I, a, i'm familiar with that place it was yeah. in a mountain somewhere yes uh, i understand and yes. um, it is very expensive and I, i'm a I, proud I, alum, I, alumni alumnus of that place um, yeah. and, um, the, I raised the money. This is before, what do you call it? Um, GoFundMe. This was in 1994. Right. And I mean, I got people to sponsor me. I figured out a way to pay for it and go, and it changed my life. I, I met, um, people who clued me into maybe that this actually would, could be a career for me. But then, of course, I was also there with other people who it was an amazing experience for them. And now they're, uh, uh, you know, heart surgeons. So it, it it's such a transformative experience. And here's why. It's a chance to only focus on music, which is even hard when you're an adult. <laughs> I mean, it's that's a, not just it's like impossible. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's not just like a, you're a kid and you're trying to get away from AP history or you're trying to uh, get away from math. I mean, for all of us, it's a special time, whether it's faculty or the guest artists or the students, it's a place to come together. It's a retreat, a summer festival, especially Sewanee, uh, and to just pour yourself into the music, to learn um, either a new piece of music or revisit that old war horse that you maybe never got to play. Maybe you grew up always hearing Scheherazade and you haven't had a chance to play it. You finally get to like put those, bring those notes to life. And um, I think that's one of the most important things, but also all the summer festivals I did over the years, I met people who become lifelong acquaintances and friends. Um, And it's a way that's not very artificial because you always hear, especially now with social media and stuff, people network, learn to network. You don't have to learn to network at a summer festival. You just go and be you and be there in the music and you are networking. You're just in it in a way that, it's not the same when you're in your day-to-day life. And, and for me, that's how I ended up going to school in Boston. I, I studied uh, with a Boston freelancer named Gregory Newton at the summer festival that I was at. And he said, you know, there, there's this fantastic Boston symphony bassoonist you should audition for. And I remember saying, well, no, no, no. I mean, I'm, I couldn't possibly. And he's like, no, you could, and you should. And that's how the whole story gets started. And um, I've seen that happen with my own students. I've had students uh, both at LSU and at Frost who have went to Sewanee specifically and come back and be like, I want to do music for a living, you know? And you're like, well, you know, here's all the reasons you shouldn't. And they're like, you can't. Right, right. And then after we try to talk them out, right. We try to talk them out of it for half an hour. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, it's magical. It's the only way. And then Sewanee's like going to, let's, let's just be honest. Sewanee's like having a summer music festival at Hogwarts. Yeah. I, I think that's a fair comparison. Yeah. It really is. And and folks, I'm I'm serious. It's one of the most physically stunningly beautiful places in this country uh, to do a music. I mean, just your walk every day. You're just the it, campus is so gorgeous. It, it's a beautiful campus. And I, I, I know that um, 
especially this summer because we weren't able to, to be there. I mean, in talking to our patrons and our supporters and, of course, you know, with Hillary and there in, in town, our, our managing director, I mean, just so many folks have just felt this absence of the festival. And, you know, there are some practical as absences, you know, from, from the business community and from, you know, but also things like the July 4th celebration and, you know, the Friday night student performances and just the ability for the folks in town and our, our patrons and our supporters to connect with faculty. I mean, we build relationships with these folks, right? I mean, and, and the students that come back every year do. And so I think there's such a, a great, you know, I hate, I sort of detest the word synergy, but there's this great sort of symbiotic relationship between, you know, the community and the, 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 the festival. And I just know how excited we are to get back to that. And I, I'm optimistic um, because I'm generally optimistic that we'll be able to do, you know, something in person, but we'll have more info on that soon. Um, Gabriel, it's been great to have you, uh, to have the chance to chat with you today and also, um, really wonderful to have you on the faculty at Swanee and, and on the faculty for our, um, winter program, which we'll get more information out about, but, uh, you know, we'll, we had a great, I keep saying great. We had a wonderful time. Um, the last time we were together, we did the Copeland, right? Appalachian Sports yes. Beat. And that was such a privilege for me to be able to conduct and really just more to enjoy being on stage with these great players like you and Donna and, uh, and others that were playing there. So thank you for making the time today and uh, for for this incredible sharing your great music and recordings and projects with us and anything real quick to, to kind of send folks off with or to just share anything. How do we find you, right? How do we okay, how do yeah. we find Gabriel Beaver's rock rock and roll bassoon star? Like, I think you go you? to the Beauport Classical website. Do you have that? Uh, I do actually. Thank you for that. And you can you can support the album directly by uh, either buying a physical or a digital okay. copy there. Or if you're a streaming type person, I mean, I almost cringe to say it because, you right. know, go buy the album. But on the other hand, I'm also realistic. It's everywhere. There's not a place you can't find my music uh, in a streaming uh, uh, sense. And what I hope you'll do is not just listen to mine. Go, if you like the composers, if you like Robert J. Bradshaw's piece, listen to his other works. If you like Brett Deet's music, listen to his other music. If you, uh, Charles Norman Mason, who wrote Swagger for me, is a Prix de Rome winner, right? Wow. Like, these guys have extensive catalogs and please listen to their music. And then the last thing I'll say is just how grateful I am to be on the fact that Swanee, when you're a, uh, I was a full-time orchestra player for a while and I've been a full-time college teacher for a while, having a summer home, a summer place where I get to continue teaching and sharing and maybe with a wider audience than I get um, from the people who choose to go to Miami necessarily, um, that feels like you've arrived as a as a professor and performer having a summer festival is is just great i told my um uh one of my mentors wilford roberts who's the former principal of the dallas symphony that i was teaching at swanee he just he thought that was great because apparently he had taught there in the late 60s and i thought wow that's or 70s i don't know before so for us great. right yeah but anyway um thank you and i just I, I i look forward to the auditions um that's such a treat too that people send in i mean we i get to hear auditions for frost as well but one of the things that's special about a place like swanee is i'm hearing everything from high school all the way through graduate students and to see the the spread of talent is really really special it's it's great to be with you today and it's uh, swanee is a special place and and we're all excited to get back to it and uh so gabriel thanks so much i'm gonna uh we're gonna wrap up here but just stick around for a second after and um thanks everyone for watching and this will be on our youtube channel and if you want to learn more about swanee and the winter festival or gabriel go on the internet we're everywhere all right <laughs> thanks everybody